It is 7.01 p.m. on October 7th, and I call the Richfield Transportation Commission meeting to order. The first item on our agenda for this evening is to review and approve the agenda. And with that, um, if I would like there to be a change made to the upcoming meetings, that should change to November 4th, if that's correct. Um, since that's pretty minor, uh, is there any objection to changing that? No. Okay. Um, with that in mind, if uh, there's anyone who'd like to make a motion to review and approve the amended agenda. Commissioner Walls to move to approve. It's been um, a motion made by Commissioner Walls. Is there a second? Second from Schmidt. Second from Schmidt. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay. Uh, and then before we get any uh, farther here, Jack, should we do a, uh, a tally roll call? Uh, yes, Aye. we should. Okay. Is uh, Scott, if he's on the line, would you like to run that? I know you've normally done that in the past. Yeah, Mr. Chair, Commissioners, um, I'm going to kick roll call off to my counterpart, uh, Olivia, a civil engineer, Richfield Public Works. She's going to be kind of uh, Jack's right hand woman going forward in these meetings. So, uh, Olivia. Thanks, Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is my first time doing this, so bear with me. Um, all right. Uh, is Chair Dunser here? Present. Uh, Vice Chair Severson. All right. Uh, Commissioner Chilman. Here. Here. Commissioner Schmidt. Here. Commissioner O'Howard. Here. Commissioner Edgerton. Yes. Here. Commissioner Waltz. Here. And Commissioner Zerzak. Here. Great. And then uh, liaison O'Leary. Here. Great. Um, Council member Troutman. And then liaison went. All right, then I'm good. Wonderful, thank you very much. The next item on our agenda for this evening is to review and approve the minutes from the September 2nd, 2020 meeting. Has everyone had an opportunity to review the minutes from that meeting? And are there any questions? If not, um, if so, a member would like to make a motion to approve the minutes, we can start that. So moved. All right, so moved. And uh, who uh, who moved, please? Commissioner Edgerton. Commissioner Edgerton, thank you. Uh, is there a second? I'll second, I'm Commissioner Bradley. Thank you very much. Um, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Our, our minutes have been approved. Moving on into our agenda for this evening, we have the 65th Street Detailed Design Studies. And for that, I will ask Jack to take over. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll talk a little bit about process uh, here tonight as we go through this. So you, the project is the engineering processes kind of go through a conceptual design that we get to what we call preliminary design in our transportation projects that have a lot of the substance and the function, but not necessarily all of the engineering detail. Um, and what we do then after it's approved at the preliminary design, we go into our more engineering detail. And on 65th Street, there was a handful of issues that we have done further study and engineering on. And um, where, where I would say, being engineers, we like to use percents. So we are now achieving what we call 30% engineering, um, which takes that preliminary design and it puts all the survey data, all of the, all of the engineering data that we can find 
uh, starts to get into all the utilities and we get a ideally it's a pretty similar looking picture but it has a lot more engineering validity behind it uh, so the effort we typically don't do that level of effort until we have like a target um, so as we approach our 30 percent um, i want to kind of go through these the trail width question i think the question was since there's uh, no on strike bike lanes that the trail becomes more of a critical feature for all the mixed use. Uh, so the question was, can it be wider than, than what's proposed in the preliminary design? There were questions about Wendy's access. Uh, we did meet with Wendy's and I'll show you what, what they felt was a preferred uh, layout. Um, planted median near the hub, that S curve area and the Pillsbury intersection design so that it's more of an intersection than something that appears to be high speed. Um, and I've kind of added uh, a talk a little bit tonight about how the trail into Richfield Lake connects and it dovetails into another program that uh, the city has uh, already approved and funded part of. Uh, which is a, a, I'll call it a downtown area signage plan. So I'll kind of run through these. Feel free to shout out a question as we go along. So our first one is uh, kind of talking about Richfield Lake. Um, can the trail be 10 feet wide? And one of our concerns, because we didn't have all the survey, is could we do that without taking out trees in the park? Um, some of you might remember on Lindale to get the design to fit in. We ended up going down the hill into Woodlake Park, and we didn't want to repeat that. Uh, there were obviously concerns uh, we all had about the tree removal. Um, but the short answer here is maybe you can see on, on the sketch is that it does fit. Um, in simple terms, there was no sidewalk on the south side by the buildings, but we have enough right away to put in a 10 foot sidewalk, no grass, uh, but we use narrower parking and narrower lanes than are out there today. So that with a narrower roadway, the available shift to, towards the south allows us to put in a, a 10 foot trail with a, a little space for signs and um, other buffer areas. So, so we are able to achieve a 10 foot trail without any undue impacts to the trees in Richfield Lake Park. <clears throat> Jack, when you're doing this, um, do the engineers, do they, or do they take in um, accumulated snow and, you know, when things start to pile up and get plowed and things like that, or does this assume that will always be clear, you know, but, um, uh, you know, curb to curb? So the streets would be plowed curb to curb, but we all know that over this time, the curb gets icy. So the road and the parking in this case would become more narrow. Uh, it says seven feet here, but it's actually got two more feet to the uh, curb itself. There's the gutter pan. So it's a nine foot parking bay. Over the winter, it would probably get to seven feet. Ours are about six. Um, 11 foot through lanes, cars are about six. So you, this is scale. So you can see what it would look like. So this car is parked in a way that during the winter, the snow would, uh, the snow berm would probably be here. Um, and so that's probably where the car would park. It's illegal to park that far out if there's no snow. Um, but you can see, again, there might be trucks, but the idea that there's plenty of room, even with this 11 and seven for cars to pass. Uh, on the other side of the curb, uh, this is our city standard for, well, for sidewalks, we have two, two standards. One is uh, six feet of grass and then a six foot of sidewalk. We can't always fit that in. That six foot of grass allows the street to be plowed and the sidewalk to be plowed without interfering each other or they kind of add to each other. So, in this case, we recognize we don't have that extra dimension. So what we did is we, our city standard for 10 feet is during the winter, it will not be clear for 10 feet. It will be clear six feet. 
So in effect, you get a four foot space for snow in these tighter areas um, as, as we plow the sidewalk. Over here, again, a 10 foot trail, we might get out there with more like a pickup than we do our sidewalk plow. Um, but there's still space in here that would be this, this the street plow would go one direction and then we would plow towards the lake. So it will never be all clear during the winter, but we do have snow storage kind of built into our standards. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good question. So we can uh, also, could I just ask a quick question about, um, obviously there's no green space on the 10 foot well, on either side in this case, is there a possibility on the 10 foot sidewalk thing of doing some tree rates or anything um, other than a full planted boulevard? Um, on the south side, there are, yeah, it's an option. We do that elsewhere. Okay. So it's it's not, I don't think we've determined that at this point. We, we have not looked at the streetscaping. Okay. Okay. Looks good though. Thank you. All right, moving on to the second, and hopefully we're we're going to get you guys out early today so that you can watch some interesting TV. These um, access. So, so we met with Wendy's. We had the uh, scenarios. We had talked about the two scenarios changing uh, their access, not having the. This is the existing configuration. Uh, was one alternative. Uh, we had the other one where there was a change in the circulation uh, to close this access. Um, long story short, as you can see, they preferred this configuration, which replicates the existing access for their site. Um, again, technically, as we balance these things, there's a back to our process, you know, there's a technical review, your role kind of interprets that from a community goal setting aspiration. Uh, so technically, again, this driveway exists near the intersection. Um, there's no safety problems today. And when the green light comes through and anybody wheels into Wendy's and slows down, it, it hasn't caused problems to date. Uh, in the future with a roundabout, they're going 15 miles an hour. And so there's no anticipated issue that that would create. Um, so from a technical point of view, uh, this roundabout is also geometrically, it's it's refined. So there was a harder look at the actual right-of-way lines and the physical impacts. Um, and so the back to the 30% engineering that occurs, uh, this is brought up to more, more of the standards. Um, so, and again, we're not done with the 30%, we're approaching that. So there's still some review yet to be done on the engineering, but, um, but anyway, I'll just stop there. Any comments on how this case resulted? Yeah. Jack, real quick. So a week or two ago, see where you have the exit arrow and it's in yellow, the Wendy's? There, yep. Um, there's a woman hit on her bike uh, going on the sidewalk in person. She was coming from the south. She was heading north. And I think the person exiting maybe a blind spot or something, but she was knocked out entirely into the middle of the road. And so it just kind of brought back to mind, you know, how important this discussion is um, when we're talking about the safety of this intersection. Um, just to make some comments, uh, un unsurprisingly, I'm still not super happy with this. I, I really object to staff saying that there's no difference from the existing because, uh, as, I've, as I've said before, you now have to cross this driveway to go east-west on 65th, and that's an entirely new problem. Um, the fact that it's within the traffic control and not just next to the traffic control is quite a different experience. Um, I do want to know, first off, did did we just ask them? Did you get an opinion from like the city attorney to say if we just didn't do what they wanted, would we have to pay them? Like, is, how far has this been embedded beyond just asking Wendy's what they would prefer? Um, no, we we didn't go through the attorney. We we went when we met with them. Uh, we asked 
how they felt about the alternatives. Okay. Well, it'd still be nice if it truly is, there's almost no risk to the city that they would have to pay them for an impact if they were to just go ahead and do it anyway against their preference. I think that's worth looking at. If it absolutely does move forward with this, I still kind of want to know what this looks like. Like when I look at this, it looks like the driveway remains level. There's just so many details that make a big difference. And I think we could talk about them one on one to not bore people to death, but there's a huge difference between that's level asphalt, that little red in, or in arrow versus it remains level with the sidewalk cars that actually have to slow down and go over a humped sidewalk. And I think, as I said, the last time I looked at this, there, there's a direct conflict between getting cars out of the roundabout um, as quickly as possible and out of the way of cars moving on Lindale and the safety of pedestrians on the sidewalk. If we cared about flow of the roundabout most, we'd want those cars to whip across that driveway, get out of there as the shape of it allows. If we cared about the people walking and biking the most, we want it to be as slow as possible so that they're cognizant and moving at slow speed and at lower risk of conflict. So I, I guess, which is it or how will we determine which it is? Yeah, so if that was a question, maybe I didn't completely understand what part of the question. But my question is, how, what does that little red in arrow um, entrance into Wendy's look like? Does it, is it at grade with the street or is it going up and the sidewalk remains level through that whole area? I wish I could gesture to your screen, but I, I can't. Yeah, I, I, I'm asking the grades. Um, the, there's only a six inch difference between uh, the curb and, and, and the given sidewalk. So in that area, the driveway is coming up from the street. Okay. Um, into the Wendy's. And so there would then be a, it's, it's a detailed balance between how the sidewalk, it has to be uh, level across, essentially level. Uh, in the path of the sidewalk. So it will come up to probably halfway, three, four inches in this distance. And then the uh, it'll have to flatten out so that the cross slope for a sidewalk is achieved. Mm -hmm. And then it'll have to go catch up with the existing parking lot after, after the sidewalk crossing. So sidewalk takes the cross slope precedent over the driveway. Okay. And it, it will appear to be concrete or the material of the sidewalk is, it will not appear to be the road continuing in. Um, commercial driveways probably, I'd have to check our detail. Um, I'm not sure Olivia would be familiar with that level of detail yet. Um, but as far as the grades, I can tell you for sure the grades would be. Uh, controlled by the sidewalk. The sidewalk probably would go down three inches as you approach the driveway. The driveway would have to come up three inches, but then it's like a sidewalk that goes across as far as the slopes. So somebody walking or, or on a wheelchair going across here is the control person mm -hmm. as far as slopes. As far as materials, uh, it may be controlled by our standard for commercial driveway. I mean, it would, there, there's almost no commercial driveways that don't have an apron, but again, that's not that important. But one other thing I do want to ask about since we're on the roundabout, I, I'd asked in the past about MnDOT guidance for roundabouts is that everything around a roundabout that bicycles are going to be sharing should meet a trail standard width, and I'm still not seeing that. So I'm, I'm concerned, especially in our downtown area, if we're asking bicyclists to leave the roadway uh, to navigate the roundabout, and they're having to do that on a six-foot sidewalk, which is what I'm seeing you know, a lot here. Can that be fixed? Yeah, I'll have, him check. I'll have him check that. Okay, thank you. So following up on Sean's question, um, and this is still a learning process for me, um, is, is there a formal decision tree? Um, if in a situation like this where there's potential conflict between uh, pedestrian and automobile, um, what takes precedent? 
I mean, does the, does the auto get the priority and the um, pedestrian second? Are they both seen equal? Um, how is the, you know, uh, granted from what you said before, there's, you know, potential millions of dollars of issues here, but in the decision tree, are, are they equal or does one take precedence right from the start? Um, as far as a decision tree, it, it's not hard and fast. We try to start with a pedestrian conversation uh, and work our way from a priority. We, we start with a pedestrian. We try to then uh, understand how does it work for transit. After transit, then we talk about bicycling and then we get into the vehicle modes. So um, ultimately, the real applications, it's a trade-off. So there isn't anything that is set. You know, so, it, and again, it's how you're going to measure. So we try to call them performance measures. So when we look at this, it depends on how you want to measure it. Uh, I'll just tell you right now, that we know that the roundabout versus a signal has a host of things that this will bring together, starting with the reduction in speeds across the modes that make it more safe, um, okay. inclu including the pedestrian crossings. Okay, um, thank you. Thank so, you. so I'm just saying in the decision making, we get into these spots and how does that spot? So. When we look right here, I, I would agree that that the pedestrian priority in this location is is not as good as it would have been. But forcing them to walk across and wait for a signal and not wait for the signal, that's the reality of the bigger solution here. And so, yes, there's a detail that's challenging. But again, we we have not had inter, any pedestrian crashes at roundabouts and about dan is going to help me did my study about 60 percent of our pedestrian hits occur at signal Dan, maybe you had that number in your head better than i did. it's closer to 50 percent but yeah uh, at signals as opposed to roundabouts there were zero at roundabouts so it's a balancing. This is where we get into these trade offs. So, a roundabout, we believe, has a lot of benefits for all modes. Uh, but driveway is a concern in that it goes against what you might say our priorities. But finding a solution um, that eliminates that with, without eliminating all the other benefits is a trade off. So, that's where we get into kind of like it's a challenge. All right, thank you. Appreciate it. We will check on the trail widths as we go around, Sean. Thank you. All right, I'm going to move to um, planted median near the hub. Uh, so the answer quickly is yes. So, um, you know, the Engineering, we changed the color on this. We actually didn't have to change the curbs. So that was an easy one for them to figure out. So that was one of them. Could this be planted and bring together more of a urban feeling than just a concrete medium? So the answer there is yes. Probably not a surprise to everybody that helped. Uh, then we were asked to look and make this more of a normal intersection from the, uh, we had that kind of challenge about northbound. Uh, we were trying to separate this, let me move. We were trying to separate right only so that you couldn't go straight. There was no hint that you could go straight and put a little concrete island in here and it was commented that it starts to look too fast for an urban street. Uh, so our our end result is going to be paint and a sign that says nobody goes straight. Uh, maybe not be the best engineering, but our priority was to provide 
full access to and from the north uh, from 65th Street to relieve the uh, traffic. Um, so that that's how uh, we've modified this intersection. So on the planting or and or the intersection, I think Dan Edgerton and Sean, you had comments about the intersection design. This looks way better to me. Just just to be clear, can eastbound are they allowed to turn left, or would that be signed against it? Or oh, eastbound you can turn left. You can yeah, okay. You can turn so it's just just discouraging that hub through movement. Right. We okay. tried to do it. We tried to do it with engineering. And we never found a good way. Yeah, I, I think this, I, I, there's still probably going to be some resistance. It might be nice if that striped sort of median on Pillsbury could be a planted median just to further emphasize that you're entering a residential area. Yeah, right where your cursor is. Um, yeah. In general, I think this looks a lot better than it was. I'm also wondering, just given the fact that, again, we, we don't allow anybody to turn right there now, do we need like quite such a large turning radius as if like a semi is going to turn into that neighborhood that way? But that, that's pretty detailed. It looks a lot better than it did a month or two ago. Yeah, as they back to the engineering, so it, as Sean talked, we do have software that actually drives trucks around the corner. I think this is for a bus. Um, one of the issues with about 24 hours ago, this was a raised median, uh, but our maintenance staff said they couldn't plow in here. Uh, it was going to be too narrow. So that's why we had to eliminate the, uh, the raised aspect and just use paint. So we we did try a lot of things, but we, you know again we get in our review. So this this I hope is a more standard normal intersection that uh, we would like to advance with. Um, in in terms of you know maybe placating the people who live on that block a little bit for you know this trade off, are there any plans for what is going to happen with that current cul de sac, you know round paved area now that isn't going to be needed? I mean, I assume just temporarily, you know, just grass would be put in, but do you know of any long-term plans that could maybe, you know, improve it even more and, you know, make it more attractive for the residents? Yeah, um, we we haven't got a answer to your question, but we've raised the same question. Um, and I raised it internally. This is something that we have talked with, um, you know, the budgets are a big deal right now, so it's hard for anybody to commit to anything, but is is there any other features, let's just say a park feature, anything, um, that this could be considered something other than, like you just said, grass? Um, so that, that goes well beyond the bounds of what I can talk about, because I, I'm talking about a different department, a different budget. Um, but we are having those conversations, I guess is the best way for me to say that could could this become more than grass at the end of the day, including, of course, this um, piece of road that would come out. So that's that's going to be studied. But it's not something it's not anything from the public work side. It's just an opportunity that we raise for others to evaluate. Um, there's no budget for anybody to propose anything right now, but this won't occur for a couple of years. And, and features like this would be typically installed after the road is redone. So hopefully something that's got a couple of three years for people to noodle on that we can come up as a city and something better here. Jack, just curious, who's maintaining that now and mowing it? Is it... Um park or is that city public works yeah. public works um jack i just have one other thing looking at this currently there's a short sidewalk on the east side that lets you get to bypass the one way basically to get in there 
Um, I am noticing also we have an apartment building on the corner. I, I think maybe you should consider for the apartment building's lot uh, doing a sidewalk so that people, as they're approaching that busier intersection, don't have to go all the way up past the stop sign where cars are turning to approach it. And I'd say that I think it's particularly justified that you have an apartment building there. If it were a new apartment building, we'd ask them to put in a sidewalk. Um, it might be nice just to have some option to make sure that people on Pillsbury can safely get to that trail on 65th. Is that what you're talking about right here? Yeah, basically a little stub sidewalk to go from alongside that property, that multifamily property. Yeah, that that most likely would fit. Kind of a grade there, but it is today too. Sidewalks are flat, so I don't know if anybody has, I don't have the detailed experience about how, I have a sense there's a hill. There. There's a, hill on, there's a hill on Pillsbury, and I'm not sure how much you're regrading. I'm not sure if you get into ADA stuff, but whatever it is, it currently does that on the east side. Yeah, the only, yeah, we, we'll take a look at it, but uh, okay. I'm just going to comment with what happens if this is a hill. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what happens is you can't have a hill or a sidewalk. You have to cut into the hill. Yeah, yeah. And all of a sudden, we're cutting into their yard get to a sidewalk so it might be challenging yeah it, it looks pretty flat in terms of cross slope just on google but i don't know I, I appreciate you looking at it though all right i want to take a little bit of time move back over words um the post office side. Um, this is a this is the project that I told you. This is approved um, by the city council. Um, it's partially funded. It's a network of signage. Uh, the program itself uh, is trying to identify like a district. Um, so if if you would think of your someplace, and I'm just gonna do the Eagleton thing. So we're 50th in France. It's a thing, it's a place. So trying to enhance the community identity. Um, this plan is called Lakes at Lindale. And what it does is it's a series of types of signs. And if I scroll, you see wayfinding signage, kiosks, um, all sorts of information as uh, you kind of move around that and so trying to, so this was put together a few years ago. Um, I was the wet blanket because I said, you know, we're going to rebuild 66 and Lindale and 65th. But most of your signs are going to be in my way. So they hit the pause button. Um, we're, we're now with, with the projects being completed, uh, re-energizing this project. Um, we don't have a schedule yet, but uh, we're working on prioritizing the type of signs that would go in first with the budget that's set. Um, so with that said, I just want, I think I showed this before. Um, so this is zoomed in. So we are now over by where the trail goes into Richfield Lake from 65th Street. And this, by the way, engineering, we have done uh, the beginning of our stormwater system. And I jumped here just as a refresher. There's flood curves near the hub, in the hub, uh, actually over top 66. And there's a pond over here um, at Holy Angels. So that highway actually floods across there. So to relieve that and facilitate a redevelopment, there's a plan for them to be able to pipe into a new pipe, larger pipe that will take the water into Richfield Lake. There is a pipe there today, but it's not big enough. So we're gonna upsize, it's actually not gonna be a pipe, it's gonna be a box, box culvert. Uh, so it's a pretty major thing. And then it, it goes where the existing one goes, right into the lake over here. So when we do the pipe, Near the trail, there'll be some additional tree removal that is because of the utility, not because of what we talked about a minute ago. We 
We aren't going to do it for a wider trail, but we will have to for this pipe. So that opened the door to, you see this sketch? There's two sketches uh, that show both different paving and different signage. Um, so it, in the study that was done, they looked at a couple of different ways that we could incorporate a signage plan, uh, but it maybe even in this area have a different paving plan. But we're gonna be working with um, community development and the parks to try to refine first um, what the paving might look like. So might be other options. You see here, this is one that has a couple of benches, a kiosk on a wayfinding. So these are all modular concepts. This is separate kiosk and wayfinding out by the street, no benches. Um, either way, I guess what I'm trying to say is we can put in paving because we have to, we're gonna tear it up. We can repave this trail. Um, and then when the program for the signage figures out what and when it can build, it's coordinated so that we have, you know, something, maybe there's a third option that comes out of the, the idea. Any questions about the signage program and or how it works in with our project? No, I think that looks great. It kind of gives a uh an entrance almost on that south side, a little bit more of a feel like that, especially it being coordinated between the program and then obviously the work on the street itself. And you mentioned that the signage will be at the kind of like the top of the hill at the entrance. So then where will the benches be? Because there's a hill that goes down kind of like right on the side of 65th Street is um, across from Pizza Luce. That's a hill that goes down into Richfield Lake. Yeah, in the trail, so this is just like a wide spot in the trail. So if they choose this option, as you get close to, this is a sidewalk today on 65th Street, and then the trail would kind of go that way. The pipe comes through and we got to rebuild everything. So we could rebuild a flat spot for something like this. Uh, this one doesn't have benches, so it's less, this is almost like what's out there today with a little tiny place where you could read a kiosk. This is more of a minimal, this is a little bit bigger. It's got, again, some benches um, that, that would add a different function. Uh, requires a bigger flat spot. And so we, we are gonna try to work hand and glove over the next several months to try to figure out Again, there's there's two aspects. One is there are a lot of signs. Um, so you see, as you're walking along a trail, there's little fence posts or, or mile post type of signage. So these purple ones are different than the orange ones. There's bigger signs that say welcome to Richfield, but more welcome to the district. Uh, so there's a whole list of types of signs. The big reports, so I don't know some of these but yeah so some that just go on signs like this. so there's a host of information signs around this plan and so the first aspect is to try to prioritize if we only had a certain budget what would you do first and then does that fit in the budget so that's the second step we've met on it i'll just tell you um it's the arrow signs that seem to be the highest priority from staff. Now the question is, do we have enough money to put the arrow signs in this plan or half of them or all of them? Um, and, you know, so it's back to what are the priorities. So um, I doubt, I'll just be honest, I doubt that these little wooden posts that give you an orientation as you walk around the lake but see, this is trying to connect. There's quasi public artwork. If you're not aware, behind City Bella and Gramercy, there's a there's like a pub, quasi public. It's developed by the private, but it's full of um, it's a public space um, built on private land as part of the development. There's also a sculpture garden back here by the Oaks. 
if you're not familiar with this, that's the challenge of this project. So if you're walking around and you want to go between the lakes, so you want to walk from one lake to the next, people don't know. And that's what this is trying to address is that when you come here that you not only do you, uh, you don't know about some of these other features that hopefully this program as you walk around, you would see, hey, there's a thing right over here that I never, I didn't know that existed. So that's the dilemma that they're trying to do. Some of the stuff that's been, people just don't know. Just curious, do you guys know about the sculpture garden? Who, who, who does? I did not until I saw this, this work when it first came around. I was on the planning commission when they talked about this and planned it, and I forgot about it. I don't, and I have friends who lived at the Eagle. Yeah, I think very, uh, very much not aware. <laughs> so hopefully, like I said, this is a staff when we coordinate, we find synergies. Um, and so, like I said, so, I was the wet blanket back in the day. I'm the one that killed the whole project from it being done because half of the signs that they're putting in, I was going to tear out. Um, so anyway, so we're back to looking forward. So um, do you know if they're going to also get rid of the fence that's as you enter Richfield Lake, there's a fence um, that's kind of like on the right side. Oh, I didn't see that in the drawing, but I I'm unaware. So you're saying there's a fence on the side? On the right side, yes. Well, it might be about this pipe. Um, so when the pipe comes out, I think there's a pond type of thing that it outlets into. And they maybe don't want people walking into that. Uh, so I'm speaking. Well, it's I think the fence has been there for a long time because it has a whole bunch of kind of like um, bike locks on it. Ah. So, well, that's where I was going. I don't know. I didn't know there was a fence. It's a park feature and or it's a pipe feature. Um, the pipe is going to tear this area apart. Put in a new pipe, but they have a similar idea. It's just bigger and then they're going to have a pond. If for safety purposes, they want a fence to protect the pond, if that's what it's for, it'll go back in, I'm assuming. Otherwise, we'll have to learn why there is a fence and do we still need a fence, but that then becomes a park question. Because I don't want to say our project ends here, but now our project kind of coordinates and does this stuff, um, but at some point it's a park. So I, I, I don't know about the fence, but I'll, I'll look into it. Okay. So I would just say, um, kind of back to a process or learning curve of how we work together. Um, so you see, there's a lot of technical things we do. We always ask you to look at them, not saying you can't comment on technical stuff, but ultimately, you know what I mean? Help, hopefully we're in a synergy to implement other aspects of the city vision and the long-term livability and quality of life in the city. So. Um, yeah, so those are the focus points. We we need you. Hopefully, you know it's it's that bigger question about is Richfield in the in the right direction. Uh, technical details, we try to interface. So uh, I do have the layout. If there's any other questions that somebody's been thinking about about the project, I had one question, uh, Nicola on sixty fifth. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing the answer is no, unfortunately, because they're doing concrete work now, but is there any possibility of getting a crosswalk across the north leg of that intersection? 
particular thinking I'm like, if you're in that apartment building just north of Wells Fargo right now to cross it, you'd have to to get to the trail, you'd have to cross three sides of the 65th and Nicolet intersection. Did the county do it now? No, but I would say 65th is not set up. As, I mean, it's unfortunate there's a brand new curve there, but um, it isn't really as well set up for it or it doesn't make as much sense as it would after the 65th redo. Yeah, I guess the county just did whatever the county would do. I guess. So if they didn't do it now, I guess the answer is going to probably be, oh, no. Yeah, because it gets into this over here. That was their concern about the bank driveways. Um, oh, yeah. Okay, sorry, it's taking a while for your screen to load. So they just didn't want to crosswalk close to the bank driveway. That's the issue. I'm good. I'm good. Wow. Okay. Oh, what one other outstanding thing was uh, about the width going down to connect to the existing wide sidewalk on Lakeshore Drive. Was that is that done or is that going to happen? Um, yeah, that's done. Okay, that is done. Yeah, so I'm assuming, Sean, this is where they have the driveway. I'm just assuming. Okay. So they just came out here and upgraded this. Yeah. Pretty major changes. If that's not done, I'm going to guess. I don't know for sure. Okay. Should have been their concern. Uh, try to run to the others. I think that was how was easily addressed. Yeah, the trail trail goes on the west side all the way to sixty six. Okay, perfect. Any other comments on sixty fifth Street? Seeing none. All right. Um, should we move on to updates? Um, we'll send it over to Olivia. Great. Thanks. All right. I'll uh, try to keep it short and sweet. So uh, I'll start with 66th Street. So good news about poetry. I believe it was about three weeks ago. Uh, the poems on Portland got a nice touch up, so those are all cleaned up, which is good. The ones on 66th Street look good too. I just did a final walkthrough, so that's all squared away as well. Um, so if you're around, you should check them out. Uh, as far as the streetscape goes, earlier, I want to say it was about two weeks ago, I walked uh, 66, took some notes down on the boulevards and the condition they're in, and I just had a meeting with. Uh, Joe Powers and Chris Link about it, I believe it was yesterday. Um, and long story short, uh, we're probably not gonna be able to do anything in the fall since it's kind of late in the season to do any like, like seating or anything like that. But what we are gonna do is we're gonna send a letter out to the residents, basically reminding them that, hey, this boulevard is you know yours to take care of at this point. If you're having any issues, we can discuss solutions with like seating or possibly killing some weeds if it's really, really bad. Um, so that's kind of on hold, but once spring rolls around, we'll be back on that. Um, some other updates that aren't on the list, but are probably good to mention, uh, Pillsbury Avenue just had its mill and overlay completed. I believe it was yesterday afternoon. It's really, really good, much better than it was before. Um, and yeah, it's, it's in a lot better condition. I think I have one more, but I can't remember it, but that's that's all I have for now. <laughs> Olivia, I have a question on, on Lindale. Did um, the speed limit signs get installed? Um, I'm not sure. I haven't been out there this week yet, but I can check. I can probably check later this week and then let you know next meeting. Um, I did today i know that the only thing that still has to get done on lindale is landscaping and then uh city bella is in charge of replacing the concrete um just for the commission um 
one of the things we actually changed during the engineering the detail design. Um, we went through a process. Uh, Lindale used to be a 35 mile an hour road. Before construction speeds were, well, half the people were traveling higher than that. Um, in, in the area of 68th Street, let's say, along the park. Um, we, we went down a path that that was our, our basic assumption, but we did process um, to change Lindale, not just the construction area, but all the way up into the Minneapolis, the Minneapolis border to turn the entire road into a 30 mile an hour speed. So we're in the process of now implementing that if it hasn't been, and I apologize, I've been hiding in about four hours from Richfield this, this COVID summer. So I, I personally can't give you an update, but we are anticipating the new 30 mile an hour speed limit to be established on Lindale. And that will take it all the way from 62nd Street to uh, 77. Kind of uh, education plan um, for the public, or is it just going to be in, in forced with uh, warnings from law enforcement when it comes into effect? You know, that's that is a good question. Uh, Scott's online, so Scott will take a note about that. Um, as most things um, that I do, especially when they are changes, uh, I'm sure Facebook will have a long thread. <laughs> But sure. Scott, Scott uh, please make a note that we proactively start that thread. Uh, yeah, Jack, commissioners um, definitely will utilize their social media outlets to promote that change uh, in addition to the signs. I think um, because the contractor's contract had them physically making and installing the 35 mile per hour signs. Um, I think they're going to make the signs for us and we're going to install them uh, public works wise. So um, definitely we'll uh, beat the drum on that so we don't catch people off guard. I just want to say I really appreciate this change being made. Um, I know you guys were maybe going to just put up those 35 signs again. I think this is a step in the right direction. I think we've, we've seen a lot of change of this in Minneapolis and other cities. Uh, I think it's it's such a good idea, in fact, that we should be looking and asking the county to do the same um, where they're allowed to easily with bike lanes, as Minneapolis has done. I would love to see Nicola, uh, Penn, Portland get consistent with this as well. But with the street that we can easily do ourselves, I'm glad that we're doing it. So thank you so much. Yeah, a sidebar, but related to that, um, I got an email this week. Edina is also uh, studying. A change to the speed limits in the city of Edina, uh, where we have a common Xerxes Avenue south of 66th Street. Uh, they're currently proposing a 25. I think there's going to be their general standard on residential streets. Um, so it is happening. They are just studying it. There's a lot of process that they will go through, uh, through their commission and council, et cetera, before their plan is. Uh, worked out, but anyway, so you're right, Sean, it is a trend in the area. Our staff approach has been to uh, not lead on this one. I'm trying to think of the cliche, bleeding edge, we don't want to be there. Um, so we're we're trying to learn from the experiences in these other areas, uh, because there's always a concern that it doesn't really change traffic behavior because you change a sign. Um, and so there's a big burden on enforcement, um, which can cause a whole nother series of issues, unintended consequences of more traffic stops. So we're cautiously trying, we're hopeful that Minneapolis, St. Paul, Maybe a Dyna will have some experience that show that it's slowed vehicles down. It's not just a sign program, that it's an actual safety improvement for the community. Um, and then we we would take that information and do our own process to advance it. So that's way out there, but anyway, it's just, just somewhat related. 
Uh, the next update here is the nicklet mill and overlay and medians. So the mill and overlay got done from Minneapolis into the 66, well, 67th, almost past Holy Angels. Um, and they have now come back and um, started doing the curb cuts at 63rd and a median at 63rd into that Nicollet Park area. And they've also gone south and are putting in medians at 71st, 2nd, and 73rd streets as we speak. So, um, so that's very exciting because for you that have been on the commission for a while, you know that we did a demonstration on Nicollet to the south trying to show that this type of change like we did on Portland, make it safer. And there's a the park, there's a library on and on and on. And uh, while this, we felt this study was successful, the county required us to remove all the installed crosswalks because uh, it didn't meet their engineering thresholds. How many people cross in a given hour? And, uh, but they have now come back and what they're doing out there, they recognize the significance of the medians on Portland. And honestly, I'll just tell you the engineering on those medians on Portland, you know, they're like little stubby things. And it, it's more of a, I think you, Lou, you asked that priority question. It's mostly to create a pedestrian refuge. Then it also raises driver awareness because you have to turn your wheel to go around it. And there's a tree, so the awareness and speeds are down. So that was because of the pedestrian desire to cross Portland more safely. It wasn't about provide a left turn lane for 100 cars a day. And so anyway, the long story short on that is the, the priority was now seen by the county on Nicollet to implement the very same, what I'll call not full engineered, but with the priority for pedestrian crossings. And they are doing that on Nicollet. So I, I think that's another trend um, for the city and working with Hennepin County, that's a significant uh, gain. And we all know Penn could be next. Jack, this is this is uh, Dan Edgerton. I, I I just want to say for the record that I think that's that's a really great project. And in addition to the benefits that you already mentioned, I think it's also really great that it shows we can do these types of improvements without doing that uh, quote full engineering that you talked about. We can do it without that full multi-million dollar reconstruct project like we had at 66th Street on more of a maintenance type of project, which is which is much more affordable for the city and the county to tackle and still moving towards the, the overall guiding principles of the city. That's a great point, Dan. Scott, you wanna provide the around the airport update? Uh, yeah, Jack, commissioners, I've got a few things that um, you might be curious about. Uh, briefly, yeah, on the agenda here, Highway 5 around the airport. Um, the westbound 5 road and ramp closures bridge repair is uh, progressing well, I'm told. Uh, we're kind of uh, uh, three steps away from that project, but the work will continue through October and hopefully wrap up uh, as we... Uh, step into November at some point, uh, weather dependent. Luckily, it's been really dry, but good weather. Um, so that should come to a close and it'll be business as usual as far as traffic's concerned at the airport. I don't know about travelers. Um, Orange Line, really briefly, um, work's going well on that um, the tunnel, that closure, that 35 South to Westbound 494 closure. They're, they're, they're giving us a hard date of a November 25th when that will reopen. Um, so that's good for those folks that would travel through there. Um, I think what Olivia had said she missed was her crack ceiling project. So I'll cover that quick. Um, we've got a crack ceiling contractor, a route and seal contractor coming into town. Um, 
think as soon as next week, um, they're going to crack seal the areas that were mill and overlaid as part of our accelerated mill and overlay program, the areas that were done in 2017 and 2018. So um, again, that's just kind of that last step in the um, pavement management program that we've had going for six or seven years now. So, um, and then one thing, Jack, you might have to back me up on this, but I think it's cool. It's kind of exciting. If you travel Diagonal Boulevard uh, in East Richfield, um, really that stretch where it does head southwest um, and crosses Bloomington Avenue, the city, um, well, Jack, uh, traffic control committee studied it, did speed studies and what have you. Um, the ultimate conclusion was to add a stop sign on diagonal at Bloomington. Um, and we also striped a crosswalk on the east side there because it's a it's a particularly long stretch of road because of the skewed intersections. Um, the paint just went down yesterday. Signs were up late last week. Um, from Public Works wise, we've got a few phone calls, but a mostly positive reception. So, Jack, I don't know if you have anything more on that one. Yeah, it has a side. Bloomington has a sidewalk on the east side. That's the crosswalk that we striped. Um, it also is really close to the school, to the south and uh, Centennial. And so it was also a um, request as the schools have, uh, some of you might be familiar, they've somewhat expanded their walk distances, they've eliminated some of the hazard barriers. So as they have COVID planned uh, the school year, uh, and they've looked to us instances like this that that um, certain crossings be upgraded um, to accommodate a safer route to school, which is a completely different program, uh, but on a similar mission, pedestrian safety, um, specifically encouraging walking and biking to school. So, it, it, yeah, so it, it again has a lot of synergy, and so it's exciting to see that uh, come together. Uh, Mr. Chair, that's all I had, so. Okay, thank you. Um, are we on to uh, work plan then? Next steps? Uh, any other updates? Oh, sorry, uh, bike advocates or other commissions? Uh, just super quick, quick from planning commission, just a heads up. There was a project or there is a project at 1st Avenue and 66th Street to Stevens Avenue and 66th Street. That was a mixed use building with ground floor retail. And the planning commission reviewed and recommended approval of a change that would convert most of the commercial space that was proposed to additional apartments. So it's now going to be basically just an apartment building has a very small, like thousand square feet of commercial at the corner of 1st and 66th. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Um, we'll move on then to the Penn Avenue study um, and our work plan and next steps. Yeah, yeah, I won't put Dan on the spot, um, but we are trying to coordinate with the county to get their layouts for the engineering. Uh, layouts for both their overlay project that would be done next year and a vision for a long term reconstruct for that segment of Penn. We have not seen any of their engineering uh, other than a preliminary on the on the overlay. So we really need their work to go to an open house in the fall. And when I say fall, I put it in bold here, meaning. Uh, whatever it's not what we think it's the actual hopefully before december 21st um we're being challenged in our schedule uh because we haven't dan i don't know if you want to say anything but we're we're just being pushed towards the end of the year um it's out of our control i guess is what i'm trying to say yeah we did get sort of head nodding and a soft commitment that we could maybe have something before thanksgiving but the clock is ticking in terms of getting noticing and material put together for a public type of presentation. So yeah, I, I don't know. We're, we're going to continue to push, but uh, we're sort of at the mercy of of their work plan. And uh, 
not that they deserve it, but in their defense, that what, what we're being told is that they're having to prioritize um, get, getting done next year's work plan, which is a little bit behind before they can think about this long term vision study. At least that's what we've been told. So anyway, uh, wait and see on that. So as far as as we we start to look at agenda items, it looks like that's being pushed beyond any content for our any any November meeting. And similar, I'll just tell you in a similar vein, content from I-494. Um, the progress has been extremely slow. Um, so the recap, a few months back, maybe four at this point, they had what they thought was their first project uh, phase of the big vision. And um, politically, they were told to go back to the drawing board. We've been drawing slowly for four months. Um, we have yet to begin to draw a new project. We've been going through a process to understand priorities. Um, anyway, I, I telling you, I'm doubtful that by our November 4th meeting, we'll even have any content to share on that at this point. So as we get into Next uh, meetings, I, I'm going to suggest right now that content. So you may want to cancel that meeting and hopefully by December, what Dan just said, if we get a pen engineering from the county and maybe there's some progress by MnDOT um, for Thanksgiving that we have one or both of those that we might have content to share in December, but I don't see anything coming relevant for a November meeting. Uh, Jack, is that something you'd like us to take up now, or would it be better to kind of um, see if there's anything that comes up in the few coming weeks and then we could cancel it then? Um, The only other thing, and I hate to have us meet with, without a reason, uh, sometimes, and maybe for this group, when I don't know when that's the last time we did this, but sometimes we'll ask um, the planning department to come in and talk about some of these developments that are occurring around the city uh, because it's related to traffic and people, you know, the traffic studies. Um, I don't I don't have a, a recollection, maybe any you commissioners. When was the last time we had, say, Melissa Palman talk about the city's development proposals? I think it's been at least four years. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I would to do that. Um but maybe in your com your question, Wes, maybe. I can noodle to see if there's some other relevant data that we can dovetail with a presentation like that. See if Melissa might be available and see if see if there's something else that um, we can bring to the table. So so maybe it is something that um, we'll do through email over the course of the month. Is uh, but again, I don't want I don't want to make up uh, and take your time. Um, so hopefully it would be meaningful if we do have a meeting. Right. Yep. No, my thought is it's easier to cancel it in a week or two if need be than to try and put it back on if uh, something comes up. Okay. I'll, I'll see what I can rustle up. Otherwise, yeah, we can communicate and cancel if there's nothing uh, meaningful to to review. Um, so, and then our, our, so as of right now, then our next scheduled meeting is November 4th. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Um, anything else tonight, Jack? I do not. I don't have anything else. Um, do you, uh, anyone else have anything else? 
Okay. Well, not seeing anything. We are at the end of our agenda. Uh, so we are up to adjournment. So uh, we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone, very much for your time and involvement tonight. Have a good evening.